chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, we find the following verses. And it came to pass, in process of time, that the king of Egypt died, and the children of Israel sighed by reason of bondage. And they cried, and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God had respect or recognition for care unto them. We see that the, these children of Israel were slaves there in Egypt for around 400 years. By this time, they were being brutally mistreated and abused throughout their captivity. And according to God's plan, they would eventually be released from this captivity. Thus we find later on Moses being dispatched to the land of Egypt. Which brings us to our specific text, Exodus chapter 4, verses 21 through 23. Verse 21 reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand, but I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. This is a curious, quite startling passage. For in it we find the claim that God has laid to harden Pharaoh's heart. Not only this, but God promised to slay Pharaoh's firstborn son if he refuses to release Israel. So as we go throughout this study this morning, let us then consider the account of Pharaoh's hardened heart and what lessons we can learn for us today. As always, I do like to define some terms, and I think it very necessary and very beneficial for us to consider the Hebrew words employed for the word harden or hard. First, we have kozak, kozak, which to strongs is defined there as to be strong, figuratively courageous. To cause, to be strengthened, to help, repair, and even fortify. The ISBE refers to this as to make strong. According to Wilson's Old Testament word studies, Kozik means to brace up or tighten in opposition to a state of relaxation. This is the word used of the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. And it implies his strengthening himself against all fear and alarm, stoutly resisting the warnings and motives urged upon him and the terrors of God's judgments. Sometimes this word is used of God's hardening Pharaoh's heart when he left his own or when he left him to his own obstinacy, which is stubbornness, and rebellion and withdrew that favor or benevolence by which alone he might have been brought to relent. So basically, it signifies to strengthen, confirm, make bold, or make courageous. Our second Hebrew word, kosha, kosha. Strong's defines this to be dense, tough, or severe, to be cruel, be fiercer, to make grievous, sore, 
or stiff-necked. ISBE says it's to be heavy, to make hard. Wilson's defines it as to be obstinate, intractable, which is not easily to be governed or directed. Furthermore, it's perverse and is applied to that which is very difficult or even distressing. And third, cabade. Cabade. From Strong's we find this means to be heavy, dull, severe, burdensome. It's to cause to make weighty or bounding with, more grievously aff afflict, to be difficult, laden, slow, or thick. The ISBE says this word means or carries with it the idea of being heavy, slow, hard, or not easily moved. And then returning to Wilson's, this word is also applied to the hardness of the heart of Pharaoh and seems to point to his insensibility and want of conviction. As the word is applied to the ear when not duly impressed with sounds or to the eye when it becomes dim. Now in a general sense, Lockyer's Dictionary of the Bible has this to say about the phrase hardness of heart. It says to become stubborn and unyielding in opposition to God's will. Further expanding on this, the ISBE, page 1338, says the hardening of men's hearts by God is in the way of punishment, but is always a consequence of their own self-hardening. In Pharaoh's case, we read that he hardened his heart against the appeal to free the Israelites. So hardening himself, he became always more confirmed in his stubbornness till he brought final doom upon himself. This is how sin is made to become its own punishment. Now we'll reference these terms throughout the rest of the sermon. But I want you to keep in mind these terms as we go through each of these passages. First, we need to consider that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Let's look at a little bit of the context first. We see from Exodus chapter 4, verses 18 through 31, though, where Moses is going to return to Egypt. We see in verses 18 through 26 where he's gathering his family. In verse 27, his brother Aaron is told to meet him in the wilderness. From there, Aaron and Moses discuss God's plan for them in Egypt. Verse 28. The brothers then meet with the elder of, elders of Israel. Verses 29 and verse 30. As a result of this meeting... The elders there believed and they worshipped God, verse 31. But then we see in Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, where Moses and Aaron meet Pharaoh for the first time. There it reads, And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I know not the Lord, neither would I let Israel go. And they said, The God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Let us go, we pray thee, three days' journey into the desert, and sacrifice unto the Lord our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. And the king of Egypt said unto them, Wherefore do ye, Moses and Aaron, let the people from their works get ye to your burdens? From this conversation we see that Pharaoh himself has no regard for Jehovah God. We must keep in mind that he himself proclaims to be a God in their pantheon. 
and is esteemed as such throughout the land. Pharaoh mocks the brothers and dismisses them. And we see then later on in verses 5 through 9 of the same chapter that he increases the workload of the enslaved Israelites. Then we see verses 10 through 14 where their taskmasters gave them the orders. Obviously the people are not very happy with this and their anger is revealed there in verses 15 through 19. So much so that they ultimately blame Moses and Aaron for their distress. Verses 20 and 21. Keeping in mind also that Shortly before this, they were worshiping God and being thankful for the opportunity. Yet now they've turned sides and are now fundamentally cursing Moses and Aaron for the current blight they're in. In Exodus chapter 5 verses 22 through chapter 6 verse 8, we see a retelling of God's promise for Israel. But we see in verse 9 that of chapter 6 that the people are still against Moses due to their current sufferings or increased sufferings. But then God reminds Moses of his mission and he thus dispatches the brothers to accomplish that mission. Verses 10 through 13. And then we see the signs and wonders from God begin before Pharaoh. Exodus chapter 7, verses 1 through 13. We see in verse 10 of this passage where Aaron's rod becomes a serpent. We see then in verse 11 where the magicians are able to produce serpents with their enchantments. However, in verse 12, Aaron's rod swallows all of them up. But then we see Pharaoh's response. Chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuseth to let the people go. Now for that word hardened, two of our words were used. Verse 13, Kozek was used. And in verse 14, Kabed was used. As I will do throughout the rest of this study, I will replace each use of the word harden with the rendering of the appropriate Hebrew term. So we'll reread we'll re those verses, employing the Hebrew words. Verse 13 again, And Pharaoh's heart was strengthened, and he hearkened not unto them, as Jehovah had spoken. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is dull. He refuseth to let the people go. Then we see the first plague, and that is the water turning to blood, verses 15 through 25 of chapter 7. All the waters of Egypt were turned into blood. We do see that the magicians of Pharaoh were able to conjure something similar to this. Because of that, we see Pharaoh's response in verse 22 of Exodus chapter 7. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. And Pharaoh's heart was strengthened. Neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said. Then we see the plague of frogs coming upon Egypt. In Exodus chapter 8 verses 1 through 15. Only after the plague was over and ended do we see Pharaoh's response in verse 15? But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he dulled his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. <clears throat> then we consider the third plague. In Exodus chapter 8, verses 16 through 19. Verse 19, we find the response. Then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was strengthened, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. So now at this point, you even see the magicians are beginning to wake up. 
But Pharaoh, however, is more and more entrenched in his false beliefs. Then we see the fourth plague, that is, of flies, in Exodus chapter 8, verses 20 through 32. Again, once the flies were removed, Pharaoh responded, or his response is seen. And Pharaoh dulled his heart at this time also, neither would he let the people go. And that's verse 32 of chapter 8. Then we see the fifth plague, the death of the Egyptian livestock. In Exodus chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Again, and Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, that is, strengthened. He did not let the people go. Then we see the seventh plague, the plague of hail and fire. In Exodus chapter 9, verses 13 through 35. In verses 34 and 35, we see that Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased. He sinned yet more and dulled his heart, he and his servants. And the heart of Pharaoh was strengthened, neither would he let the children of Israel go, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. From each of these passages, we must note the following. Pharaoh was presented signs and wonders from God. After each plague, he strengthened or dulled his own heart. For the first five plagues, as well as the seventh plague, Pharaoh's response was to meet each of them with more and more stubbornness. Well, let's consider the other side of this where God hardened Pharaoh's heart. We see in Exodus chapter one or chapter 7, verses 1 through 7, that God is giving Moses a slight glimpse into the future by foretelling the fate of Egypt and her king. Now we find the reason for this in verse 3 of that passage. It says, I will make Pharaoh's heart stubborn, and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. There the word kabed is used. Now let's again consider the plagues. The sixth plague, that is the boils and blains in Exodus chapter 9, verses 8 through 12. We see that the magicians could not mimic this. In verses 11 and 12. The magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. And the Lord strengthened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. Then the eighth plague of locusts, Exodus chapter 10, verses 1 through 20. Verse 1 of that chapter says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have dulled his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show these signs before him. Dropping down to verse 20, it says, The Lord strengthened Pharaoh's heart, so that he would not let the children of Israel go. Then we see the ninth plague, the plague of darkness. Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 through 29. Verse 27 reads that the Lord strengthened Pharaoh's heart and he would not let them go. Then we see in Exodus chapter 11 verses 1 through 10 where they're preparing for the death of the firstborn. Verse 10 there reads, excuse me, and Moses and Aaron did all those wonders before Pharaoh and the Lord strengthened Pharaoh's heart so that he would not let the children of Israel go out of his land. And then in Exodus chapter 14, verses 4, 8, and 17, which we'll read, this is just prior to the Red Sea crossing. Verse 4 says, I will strengthen Pharaoh's heart, that he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh, and upon all his hosts, 
and the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Verse 8, The Lord strengthened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. Verse 17, And I, behold, I will strengthen the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon all his host, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. Notice, though, that it was not until the sixth plague where God hardens Pharaoh's heart. In an attempt to show this point from a slightly different angle, consider the following comments. In the case of Pharaoh, God hardened Pharaoh's heart in the sense that God provided the circumstances and the occasion for Pharaoh to be forced to make a decision. God sent Moses to place his demands before Pharaoh. Moses merely announced God's instructions. God even accompanied his word with miracles to confirm the divine origin of the message. Pharaoh made up his own mind to resist God's demands. Of his own accord, he stubbornly refused to comply. Of course, God provided the occasion for Pharaoh to demonstrate his unyielding attitude. If God had not sent Moses, Pharaoh would not have been faced with the dilemma of whether to release the Israelites. So God certainly was the instigator and initiator but he was not the author of Pharaoh's defiance. Notice that in a very real sense, all four of the statement of the following statements are true. One, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Two, Moses hardened Pharaoh's heart. Three, the words that Moses spoke hardened Pharaoh's heart. And four, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. All four of these observations are accurate and depicting the same truth from different perspectives. In this sense, God is responsible for everything in the universe. He has provided the occasion, the circumstances, and the environment in which all things, including people, operate. But He is not guilty of wrongdoing by doing this. From a quick look at simple Hebrew idiom, it is clear that God did not unjustly or directly harden Pharaoh's heart. God is no respecter of persons. He does not act unjustly. And He has always allowed humans to exercise their free will or their free moral agency. God does, however, use the wrong, stubborn decisions committed by rebellious sinners to further his causes, Isaiah chapter 10, verses 5 through 11. In the case of Pharaoh's hardened heart, God can be charged with no injustice, and the Bible can be charged with no contradiction. Humans were created with free moral agency and are responsible for their own actions. Next, we consider the purpose of of Pharaoh's heart being hardened. We see that these events were used to show the one true God, Jehovah. We see that God was providing evidence to the Egyptians, including Pharaoh. Again, keeping in mind their great pantheon. Now this was accomplished by the various signs and wonders performed by Moses, or by God through Moses. Exodus chapter 7, verses 3 through 5, as well as Exodus chapter 14, verse 4. It says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, that he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. Then we also note that these events were meant to convince to provide evidence to the children of Israel themselves. Not only for those present for these events, but for generations to come. In Exodus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, we find that the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, 
For I have hardened his heart, the heart of his servants, that I might show these signs before him, and that thou mayest tell in the ears of thy son, and of thy son's son, what things I have wrought in Egypt, and my signs which I have done among them, that ye may know how that I am the Lord. Third, we see that these events were show the word of the one true God. Excuse me, the world. To show the world that there was and is one true God. Exodus chapter 9, verses 13 through 16. And we see that this was successful. If by no other way, but through the account with Rahab. In Joshua chapter 2, verses 9 through the first part of uh, verse 10. And she said unto them, the spies that is, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when ye came out of Egypt. These things weren't done in a corner. It spread like wildfire. Furthermore, these events were accomplished to show forth God's wrath. You see, Pharaoh was a wicked ruler. The Egyptians themselves, overall, were wicked as well. This country was wholly given over to a pantheon of false gods. Due to their wickedness, they would be grouped into those found in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. You see, there was a point in man's history where all men recognized Jehovah God, and they were obedient to Him. This is during the law of patriarchy, where the heads of the fathers were to act as the spiritual leader of the families. Well, we know that Pharaoh had a family. We know that Pharaoh had a broad family, that is, his nation. How was he leading them? Well, we see exactly how, by how he, create, he created a, an atmosphere of, of uh, unkindness, abuse for the Israelites. Furthermore, we see their type of worship. It is not prescribed by the Jehovah God. Thus, as we referenced earlier from the ISBE, that this came as a form of punishment on those who would do not God's will. Again, referencing Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. He has given them no shortness of evidence. Because of that, their actions are lacking, and they deserve the wrath of God. Thus we see that Jehovah God brought great judgments upon Egypt. Exodus chapter 7, verse 4. And chapter 14, verse 4 and verse 13. In Exodus chapter 14, verses 17 and 18, it reads there, Behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. I submit that this carries, or really shows more depth, for 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19. I would say this is a demonstration of that verse, and it harkens back to Job chapter 5, verse 13. 1 Corinthians there, verse, verse 19 of chapter 3 reads, For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. Now as we have seen this morning, God has hardened or strengthened the hearts of of those who would practice unrighteousness, those who would, who will to be wicked. This was done by use of that one's free will 
and not against it. We see this type of concept in the New Testament in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, where it reads, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You see, God will strengthen the resolve of one's stubbornness and love for practicing sin. We have seen this in the life of Pharaoh. As such, they will be condemned. Why? As we just read from 2 Thessalonians, that they believe not the truth. Even worse, they love not the truth. They hate the truth. Thus, God is simply strengthening the resolve that is already present in that person's life. On the contrary, God could and does supply the resolve, the strength to do good. Peter even prayed for this in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 10. Paul likewise prayed for this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Which reads, Whereunto he called you by our gospel, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast, hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or by our epistle. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. God is willing to provide us the strength we need to do good, to continue being obedient in doing His will. The first step to doing this, though, is developing a love for the truth. Then you must believe or develop your faith in that truth. Then you must render obedience to God's Word by first repenting of your sins, Acts chapter 3, verse 19, confessing Christ publicly, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, and then being baptized for the remission of your sins, contacting the blood of Christ, Acts chapter 22, verse 16. From that point forward, pray to God for strength. We often do in public prayers here. And I certainly believe that many do in their private prayers. But from there, live faithfully to God. And when this life in the flesh is over, heaven will be yours. Revelation chapter 2, verse 10. We have noted this morning and studied in quite lengthy depths that God will provide the much needed strength. The question though is, is how will you use it? Which category do you belong to? The category that includes Pharaoh, who increased his own stubbornness to rebel against God, or to a faithful child of God who needs strength, continues to ask for strength, to continue doing good. Now, if you are not a child of God this morning, why not become one? You now know what is necessary to become a child of God. Take those steps. Or if you already are a child of God, yet through sin, and maybe your stubbornness have allowed sin in your, in your life, why not put that sin away? Make confession, we'll pray for you. The choice is yours this morning. Let your choice be known as together we stand and sing.